Tavleen Singh. People know you today as a columnist, probably see you as someone who sits in an air-conditioned room with a computer. I don't think anyone, the general public, realise what it takes to get there. And what I'm really happy about is that when young people read your book, what they will see is that the path to good journalism is not looking pretty on camera and just asking contrary questions to who you have on interview. It's hard work. You, you tell the stories of our generation journalists have been through waiting endlessly in heat, in cold for hours, filthy toilets, disgusting places to stay in. And now it's become more of a glamour job with people doing very little of that um, reporting, reporting well. of being out there, hanging there, waiting for stories. When I first started News Track, I was told Tavleen Singh has thrown coffee cups at every editor in Delhi. Not true? Not true at all. I um, threw a slipper <laughs> at a press conference at a photographer who called me a BITCH in Hindi. Oh. And I turned around, I, I, I don't even know how to say, I don't want to say the word, it was so unpleasant. And there was a woman who claimed that she'd been raped by a minister. And they kept saying, tell us what he did, tell us what he did. It was kind of prurient interest on the part of photographers. And when he called me this, I threw a slipper at him. That's about the only time I've ever thrown it. No, there was Why one other time. Why did you Why didn't you hit him? I was too far away. Okay. I would have hit him if I'd been close enough. And there was one other time when there was a man called Ashok Raina who ordered a whole series of interviews with militants in the Golden Temple after Blue Star and, it, and then didn't show them, right? And I, I, Rajiv Gandhi was Prime Minister and I said to him, I said, I can't go back to Amritsar anymore because they think that I'm working for the Intelligence Bureau. So please show the interviews. And when I went to this man, he said, you know, he was very offhand and he said I couldn't care less or something. And then I did throw something at him and missed. I'm a very bad shot. <laughs> a coffee cup. No, an ash, uh, what's his name? An ashtray, I think. You apologized on Twitter for what you wrote about uh, judges should be in the dock. Why did you apologize? Well, you know, I, I sort of used the wrong um, expression because I was talking about the, the CAG being impeached. I, I felt that the CAG, I still feel that. But it sounded as though I was asking for judges to be impeached. And judges can only be impeached if they are found guilty of wrongdoing. So it was just that I worded it badly and um, because the case is still going on and because judges are very sensitive. So I had to. Got a message from the Supreme Court judges? Or? I got a message from my editor saying that I better do something about it, otherwise there would be trouble. Okay. Now, um, you write a lot about um, the government being unaware of anti-Hindu sentiments in Punjab. Um, in Kashmir, the same problem. Today we see the same thing. There seems to be for example, Assam, the trouble was brewing for six months. What do you think is in our government always where they cannot see what is happening? That's why the book is called Darbar. I really, in the many years that I've been a political reporter in Delhi, have been very worried, which is, this is the story that I'm telling, that I was actually part of just the drawing rooms of Delhi. I was kind of junior reporter, not doing very much. And then when I started to actually cover stories, cover wars and elections and riots, etc., I would come back to the drawing rooms and they would be oblivious. And then these people who were in the drawing rooms, who really should have just stayed in the drawing rooms, were suddenly in power. And I began to observe more carefully what was wrong. And I realized that around them was a cocoon of not just sycophants, but of bureaucrats who were part of the court, of journalists who were part of the court. So the disconnect between, uh, say, Rajiv Gandhi, I'm using that really almost as a metaphor now, because it's exactly the same. And I think one reason is that after uh, the British left, there should have been a decolonization of governance, which never happened. And I think that Nehru, towards the end of his life, said that he regretted that he hadn't done that. 
So our bureaucrats are trained to serve the ruler, not the people. And then in the middle of this, you've got princes and dynasty. And now, you know, I think you're under 30 MPs are all sort of heirs to some political family or the other. This is very dangerous. You know, if your daughter or my son wants to get into politics, he can only get in if he's friends with somebody who is powerful. That's wrong. So, you know, I mean, I'm no supporter of Arvind Kejriwal or Anna Hazari, but they're right about that. You know, you can't make parliament a private club. You can't have bureaucrats as courtiers. You can't have, because then what you've got is really a total disconnect between the government in Delhi and India. Two things, that it puts journalists in a very awkward position all the time, where you are torn between writing the truth and writing about people who expect a certain amount of loyalty from you because having known you over the years. You've had to face that. You've had to face that many times, writing about people that you've moved with. In fact, two of your closest friends, uh, Naveen Patnaik, who is now Chief Minister, and Vasundra Raja, who has been Chief Minister. How, how difficult and how easy has that been? Is that something that you've had to face all the time? Yes, it, it is a, a problem. Uh, I had another friend who was a chief minister. I still, I mean, I'm not that friendly with him anymore, but Farooq Abdullah. Yes. Yeah, so I first faced it in Kashmir when I was writing the, the Kashmir book. And Farooq was very upset that I had really told the truth about what had gone on. I'd actually said that he hadn't understood how serious the problem was and that he shouldn't have made the compromises that he did make. But I believe that as a journalist. But one second, which you also exposed that he was almost cornered into it. He called That's you it, yeah. and he was yes. furious that he had been given no choice by the government. Have made that, compromise. that he had to join yeah. the coalition, otherwise there would be no election for the next five years. I mean that's a great story. And he called you and told you that that yeah. he was cornered. Yeah. But he was very upset anyway, because he felt that I hadn't, you know, been fair to him. But I really believe that you and I, we face the same thing. That when it's a choice between what's good for your country as a journalist and whether some friend is going to be hurt, um, either you don't write. I don't write about Naveen and Vasu because uh, I feel that, you know, I can't write about Naveen and Vasu. And, it, you know, I mean, I just stay away from that. But it's not an advantage to have friends in high places if you're a journalist. You know, it's not as if you get any more access. It just compromises. But you do, you do, we do. Because, I mean, the interviews you got with Rajiv Gandhi, um, in fact, the story you did, uh, the cover story on Sonia, which started off uh, Arun, as an interview. As yeah. which Arun Puri had assigned you to do an interview for India Today, which then turned into a profile. kind of a profile. Now, I, I find that story fascinating because first she agrees to, Sonia agrees to cooperate. And then when Arun reads it, uh, his reaction is, I think, classic, where he says, I'm maybe willing to be a chamcha <laughs> of Rajiv Gandhi, but not of Sonia. So he said, Dilip Bob has to fix the story. Yeah. So then Dilip Bob was brought in to bring a kind of a balance to it. But then you got a very bad uh, reaction from them. And it was very odd, because actually what Dilip said was, let's put in the criticism that other people are making of her. And if you remember, people were talking about her friends using her name, which they did all the time in every drawing room that I went to. And still do? Yeah, and still do. And, and the other thing that I said was that, you know, you could either be Lalita Shastri or you could be Raisa Gorbachev, meaning that if she was going or to Nancy be Reagan. with... Or Nancy oh, Reagan. Yeah, if you're going to be with the Prime Minister, then you've got to be seen to be doing something. And she would go everywhere with him, but not even sort of do a little social program in the village or do anything. And there are obligations of public life which she wasn't fulfilling. So I just put in those two things. Those are the two things that upset her. And so I was dropped. And she said to you that that's not what I am. That's, n that's not who I am as a person. Then who is she? Um, she is... How does she see herself, you think? How would she like to be portrayed? As this kind of mythical, you know, uh, political leader with a mystique around her. The, the great, there's a lot of mystique, the, the, yeah, well, because, there's no access. Because she's, very, she's been very clever with uh, cutting access. She learned that a little from Mrs. Gandhi, who never gave any interviews. But Mrs. Gandhi was a real political leader, 
Whereas what Sonia has hidden behind, and you know, it's a very clever strategy. Because as soon as she came into politics herself, people forgot that in fact, when, when she was just the Prime Minister's wife, they used to think of her as Imelda Marcos. So she's done a very good job of you know, putting this mystique around her. And I was actually, um, I, I think it's wrong. I think if you're in public life, then you know, you, your mystique has to come from what you do and from your own charisma, not from hiding behind curtains. And it's wrong to do that, you know, I'm in, in no other country that I know, in no democratic country, can the leader of the country stay away from giving interviews. There's an obligation. I mean, you know, you've lived in America. How often does the American president have to meet the press? On every issue, in fact. On every, every issue. Every crisis, on every issue. And there's a daily briefing in the White House, you know. That is democracy. This is a kind of sham democracy in which we've really got feudalism disguised as democracy and it's wrong and it's it, I'm very glad that this huge new middle class is getting irritated by it because it has to go. Do you see the policies in fact the blueprint of Indira Gandhi being carried out in in a subterranean level if you look at the trying to control the press the media the social media um, the license Raj in many ways still continues I, I read that to open a, a retail shop, like say a franchise like Walmart, they have to get 51 licenses for one shop. So, and also the kind of fear people have of writing, speaking. That against the royal family. Against the royal family. If you actually look at Indira Gandhi's blueprint and then Rajiv's and also their foreign policy, all three of them today, it seems to be exactly the same things. It seems to be like a genetic uh, program that is being carried out. Uh, I think that in Rajiv's case, um, it may have been because there were too many of his mother's advisors still around him. He knew nothing about foreign policy. You know, he, when he became prime minister, he'd been a politician for six years. Until then, he'd seen the world through a cockpit. So he really didn't, and believe me, all these stories, this part of the mystique that's been built around Sonia, that they used to talk about politics at dinner table. It's nonsense. Mrs. Gandhi didn't allow it. And she, these two, Rajiv and Sonia, were not her political, uh, was not the political side of her family. Sanjay and Menika were, you know? And you so, said that Rajiv Gandhi was so apolitical that he was bound to make mistakes. Yes. And he was a And prince. by listening to his Baba Log friends. Yes. Yeah, instead of, but, but I don't think he could have delivered much more than he did. But really it was under him that the Punjab and the Kashmir problem got exacerbated. And he could have actually solved it had he taken a new approach, right? Now, under Sonia, I think that the, the Indira Gandhi blueprint is a deliberate move. I think that Sonia sees her mother-in-law as the successful politician as the one who ruled for 17 years. I'm not sure that she would admit it, but I don't think she saw her husband as a successful politician. So when she came into politics, do you remember there were all those stories about how she'd watched videos of her mother-in-law? And she has started to imitate her gestures, you know, those, that kind of stiff little walk and the, you know, uh, the sort of thing. Those were very Mrs. Gandhi gestures, the thin voice when she makes a speech, the sort of aggression with it. So I think that she sees her mother-in-law as a hero, still. But there were different times. Uh, people were different. There was no social media. It's a different world today. So to apply that blueprint today would be not very intelligent. Who would tell her this? I believe that her closest advisors are her two children. I don't think that any minister in the government of India would dare say to her, Madam, you know, we've got to think afresh. Hmm? At the moment, there is some attempt to try and rectify the economy by allowing in investment, by loosening the economic controls. But the, she's really doing it so that she can pay for this food security bill. And that food security bill will take us back to importing grain from the Americans. Who's going to tell her this? Because in a year that say you have a drought in three states, where's the grain going to come from? You're going to give 80% of the people of India subsidized grain? Now, isn't it much better to do what Narsimha Rao, I think he did accidentally? Because the real way to empower the poor is to give them schools 
and healthcare and roads from their villages so that they can you know, link up with towns and find new jobs and new opportunities. They're not doing this. They're doing the opposite. It's, it's just charity, you know, with Lady Bountiful sitting it at the top. It, all those programs, whether it's Narega or the Food Security, seem to be her. more to buy votes and popularity than to actually resolve any situation. Yes, the changes in the villages that have come about because of technology, Madhu, yeah, you wrote because of the that. cell phone and television. Do you know, I mean, I've seen, it, it's, it should be horrific poverty, which actually no longer exists because they've got some opportunity to, to call up and find out the price of something, to, to see what the world looks like. Otherwise, you know, in the and 80s. your descriptions of the Orissa famine, yeah. in which they were taken, uh, Rajiv horrific. and Sonia were taken yeah. on a road show where they put healthy people in front yes. of them, when people were living on uh, birdseed bird seed and for grass. For six months. It's horrendous. It's horrendous. I wanted to bring you to your Punjab story, that there was curfew in Amritsar. Yeah. And you decided to go around the other way. We had to, you see, it was the two days after Blue Star had happened. And, the, and I knew that the president was bringing a group, a group of journalists. Yeah, I could have come with that, but I'm not a rat pack journalist. I've never been. I've always liked to be on my own in these things. So I said to Sandeep, you know, Shankar, I said, let's go to Chandigarh. And the army commander, General Mehta, whose first name I don't remember, was one of my father's students in the army. So you so waved I, this letter? <laughs> I said to him, I said, he has a letter for you and all that sort of business. And so he said, what are you trying to do? And I said, nothing, because he realized that I was going to try and get in. I've actually gone to him to try and get a curfew pass. And I said, we'll join the group that's going to the Golden Temple anyway. And he said, you can't drive through Punjab. So he gave you tea and said, no, go and home. And said, go home. And threatened to spank you. And said, I'll take you my <laughs> need. But you see, I knew that, because you know, this is India, okay? So I knew that they would do the main route to Amritsar, there would be tanks, and there was martial law virtually undeclared. But they would not realize that we could get there through Moga. So I said to Sandeep, let's try it through Moga. But the funniest part of that story was that when we actually got to the, la to the last bridge beyond which lay Amritsar, this, uh, the young officer there was so impressed with the fact that I had a letter for General Brar that he said, would you have a cup of tea? And he let us through. They moved a tank to let us pass. And we got, get there and then Sandeep says, so now where do we go? And I said, let's go and actually try and find General Brar. And he said, how will we do that? I said, let's just ask people, they'll tell us. And the police told us. They said, you know. And then when you walked into this operations room, he, Brar says, how, what are you doing here? How did you get here? What the? <laughs> who are you? What, what, you know? But then, that, you know, there's also this thing that women do have this advantage. And definitely when you have a, a class difference where a junior officer, somebody sees you, the way you're dressed, your, the way you speak with authority and, and that obvious class difference. The general's daughter. Yeah. There is an advantage. Yeah, no, I think there's a big, big uh, journalistic advantage to, to be a woman. So, Khalistani militants had started carrying these capsules on strings around their neck in imitation of the LTTE. Within days, Pramod, that's Pushkarna, the photographer, yeah. received the de first death, death threat. A man who did not reveal his identity said they had seen him and me, meaning you, identify Penta and this has caused him to commit suicide, so we had better watch it. I did not know whether to take the threat seriously, so I went to the Home Minister, Bhuta Singh, who really didn't give you much help. He just basically said, uh, change your son's school route and nothing else. So then you wrote, it seemed like surreal advice, but everything about Delhi was beginning to seem surreal to me. Mm. I would come back from cov covering a war uh, or a communal riot in which hundreds of innocent people had been killed only to end up at the same dinner parties listening to the same sort of inane political conversations that the denizens of Delhi's drawing rooms specialized in. These conversations would usually be about the issue that had made headlines in the morning newspapers. Everyone would have some banal views and this would pass as political analysis. Now, do you see a change in this that because, because of the social media, because of the middle class now having more of a voice, because journalists are not coming from elite schools 
and they are doing the dirty work and you see regional uh, language journalists, Hindi speaking journalists are really getting the story. Do you see a change in this? Uh, there is a sort of change, uh, but it's the change that is being brought up, uh, brought, uh, I mean, that is coming to the fore because of people like Kejriwal, right? Because they're playing now a political role. They're not just NGOs making a racket in some village. Which is easily dismissible. Yeah, easily dismissible. Where Hindi journalism is concerned, uh, you know, I write two Hindi columns a week, in one in Jansatta and one in Amar Ujala. Hindi journalism is not in good shape. So all the big stories are really actually being broken by the English channels still. And the English channels have anchors who've been co-opted into those drawing rooms. You know, the, uh, you know how it works. You don't get to uh, Hyderabad house for dinner for the visiting dignitary unless you do some ass kissing. And it, it really is sa it saddens me that it's so easy to seduce senior journalists, as easy as it used to be then. In the earlier days, Mrs. Gandhi would give uh, editors houses in, you know, government houses and stuff. Now it's access. So I don't see that much change. And we've still got a prince in an isolated little cocoon of a court. We've got many princes now in all the states, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, you have parties that, you know, believe in it. So I don't see that much. And I actually think the book is more important today than if I'd done it then. You also mentioned in, when you were covering Kashmir, the elections, and you were giving ground realities, which were very different from the mass of journalists covering the story. What they did was, this was the 1983 election, uh, it was so clear. I mean, you could have sat in Delhi and said Farooq uh, is going to win because Sheikh Abdullah died in September 82. This election was in June or May or June of 83. Okay, They owed him one election. The National Conference would have won. But in misleading Mrs. Gandhi, the national press played a very, very bad role. They kept putting people like, you know, Malvi Farooq, the old um, Mirwais, and, you know, say that you are part of India, say, and actually you didn't need to do that. You needed to go out and talk to ordinary people in the villages and hear them say, you know, we are now part of India. Because, you know, everything had changed till by that election. Bangladesh had happened, Bhutto had been hanged, right? Kashmir was not interested in being part of Pakistan and the press lied and tried to create the impression that Farooq was stealing the election. He didn't. Why do you think the press did that? It's kind of, you know, a nationalistic thing. Their motives were probably good, but the role they played was bad. And there was, you know, we were a lot of us there. There was a lot of people that you and I know in, in Kashmir. The Amla family, let's say it as, as it is was also saying to Mrs. Gandhi, oh, women have been raped in such and such a village, and so and so and such and such. And it was just complete nonsense. And, you know, because the, these journalists weren't traveling, they were sitting in Sirinagar writing their stories, you know, on, on the basis of Congress briefs. You've written extensively about Indira Gandhi's appeal and how people saw her, the rural Indian, saw her as their leader. What do you think her appeal was? Because you, you mentioned many times that she didn't deliver at all. She did two or three things that were very clever. Um, you know, this uh, giving um, largesse, uh, land that was given to say Dalits. They'd say, Ji, Indira Gandhi ne hum If you go to villages, uh, they'll still tell you that. Indira Avas Yojana, I think, started after her. But they would be given that one room, you know, or whatever, which they thought she had given her. It was also a very illiterate electorate. There was nearly 80% illiteracy. And they didn't know. There was no television. There was no, um, you know, the, there was not even radio. And they would be told by whoever the, the Sarpanch was <coughs> where to vote, how to vote. And then, I think I describe in the book, when she would arrive, you know, in a chopper, this white-skinned woman in the, you know, looking so, so good compared to the poor, miserable masses. I think that, you know, they might have thought she was some kind of Devi. It still happens, by the way. I think if Sonia Gandhi had been Somalian 
she may not have found it so easy to win in India. <laughs> That's a good one. You should have put that in your book. <laughs> I'm in enough trouble without it. Just read this para. Then came the Congress Party's election campaign, and I began to wonder seriously whether I had completely misunderstood Rajiv. But like the rest of India, I was still prepared to give him a chance. Why? Why did India so easily forgive Rajiv for violence that as Prime Minister he was directly responsible for? Why have other leaders like Narendra Modi never been forgiven for presiding over similar massacres? I've asked myself this question many times and the only answer I've been able to find is that it was perhaps because Rajiv, for a brief shining moment in Indian history, became for most Indians a living symbol of hope. He did. It was the people who invested him with this hope because there was certainly nothing he said during the election campaign that indicated that he'd moved away from the cynical negative politics that his mother had come to represent in her last years. The election came less than two months after Mrs. Gandhi's assassination and no sooner did the campaign begin than it became clear that the Sikh massacres were going to play an important part. There is little doubt that he must have been told this by the advisors he inherited from Mrs. Gandhi because in that first election campaign he ran as Prime Minister, Sikhs as a community were maligned as enemies of the country. Do you remember this? Those ads? In newspapers across India, the Congress campaign was launched with black and white photographs of Sikhs under which a line of copy asked questions like, can you trust your taxi driver? Since the campaign material could not have been put together overnight, it made many Sikhs ask whether the attack on the Golden Temple had been deliberately planned by Mrs. Gandhi in the hope of consolidating the Hindu vote. There was a menacing note even in, in Rajiv's campaign speeches, an attitude that implied that if you were not with the Congress party, then you were against India. He accused opposition leaders of being traitors because of being electorally allied with the Akali Dal. But this campaign of hate and distrust was unnecessary. The reason why Indian voters were to give Rajiv the biggest mandate in Indian parliamentary history was because they saw him as a symbol of hope and change. But everything that he did before and after, there was nothing that had any change in it. I think that it was such a horrible year. It was just year. a glamorous look. No, it was 84. It was really the worst year politically that I can remember. Okay, you have uh, Operation Blue Star. Um, the, uh, the problem begins in Kashmir with the toppling of Farooq's government. Uh, there was the hijacking of a plane to Lahore. And then four months later, Mrs. Gandhi is killed. Which you were accused of. I was accused of hijacking the plane <laughs> and killing her, both. <laughs> but the, the thing that Rajiv, you know, on that campaign, I remember the, you know, when you would see him, so young and so good looking among these horrible old politicians and their dirty khadi, you know, he looked good. And I think that because it was such a desperate time, then there was the gas thing just before Union the election, Kabbai, yeah. the Bhopal gas tragedy, okay? Nothing more than the killings after Mrs. Gandhi's death. I mean, the, the list of what went wrong in 84 is endless. So, you know, when he, in January, when the election was, you know, when the campaign began, people just felt that if he comes, it'll be a generational change. But Everything wasn't he part of the problem in not handling the Union Carbide disaster with responsibility, not handling Kashmir with responsibility, fairly being responsible for the 84 riots. All the things that you mentioned were his problems. It's, that's what I said, I've remained completely bewildered by this. But I think that th there was a mood in the country, an ugly mood in which they felt that if innocent six were killed, it would teach them a lesson. And um, so I think he, you know, he, he sort of represented that idea. Nobody, uh, he justified the violence which Modi has never done. And you've also said that if people who perpetrated the terrible acts on the six in 84, uh, Gujarat would not have happened. I'm certain of it. Because they used the same thing. There were elect, elect, election lists with names. So you knew which house was a Sikh house and which was a Hindu in the same street. And in Gujarat, that's what they did with the Muslims. The stories of, of you and Rajat Sharma, in fact, going around and looking at what happened and the dead bodies piled up. It, it it's just horrific, horrific horrible, description. Horrible, horrible. Um, you know what was so awful? I would come back, I've actually, you know, really sort of covered up for a lot of friends in this. Because I would come back to the drawing rooms in the evening 
And there would be people gloating over the violence, people who were so educated. If I gave you their names, you would be horrified. So but why saying, are you covering up for them? You shouldn't. Well, that's what my son tells me. But I don't know, maybe I'm the kind of person that people think <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, I can tell you, but I'm not going to tell you on camera. But it used to really sicken me. I'll tell you what, you should ask Bina Ramani. There was a dinner party where her brothers were very ardent six, much more than me. And um, they were appalled because a, a conversation started. The, the hostess had a cake in, in the colors of the Indian flag. And then suddenly a very famous, very rich lady, you know, bejeweled and very educated, suddenly started saying, they should be thrown out of this country. They should be shipped, get them out of here and all that. And Bina's brothers started to get very upset. And the dinner party nearly turned into a little Hindu Sikh riot on its own. But uh, Kavleen, it's your moral duty to expose people like this because I found that, as you said, having lived in America, nobody has the guts to be anti-American in dinner conversations or in somebody's house or to say anything. They might have a debate or an argument. But you, you are called to book. You are socially ostracized. In India, people say these kind of things and we don't confront them and we don't expose them. Um, we've got used to a, ver a certain ugliness. We've got used to it. And, you know, I'm hoping that even if some people of our children's generation read this book and understand what I'm trying to say, that it isn't a book about Sonia Gandhi or Rajiv Gandhi. It's a book about all of us. I say that in the introduction. I believe that we, you and I, come from the most colonized generation that India has ever seen. And we let India down. We, who were the most privileged of India's citizens, didn't do what we should have done. And today it's continuing. We're still not doing enough. Now, they've, now you've got your Mulayam Singh Yadavs and Lalu Yadavs and their children are joining the club. But so. as journalists, our generation, I feel, have gotten into this glamorous TV mode of just, as I said, just being pretty on camera and asking contrary questions it's without doing any in-depth stories. It's very no, sad. Nobody's out there. Uh, I can't bear those evening panel discussions anymore. I myself participate, but I have to admit that, that I participate reluctantly. And it's own. frustrating. It's very frustrating because on, you don't get the news anymore. There's not. When did you last see a good investigative story on you guys should do it because there's a story a day that could be done in detail. Uh, Sam, you mentioned that earlier. Just one. It's just cheaper to call six uh, people to come to the studio or OB bands and, and you don't have to send opinion. a reporter to go out and spend a couple of weeks yeah. and do a real story. But you know, where are the television reporters? There aren't any. You know, they're just sitting here in Delhi with a little mic shoved into the face of some politician. Do you know, we, my generation of reporters, we're constantly out there doing stories. And that yeah. shows in this book. And when you and Rajat Sharma went and saw what was happening in Delhi, and Rajat Sharma's re remark that you wrote about, they're proud of what they did. Yeah. It means that the basest level of a human being comes out when there's a tacit approval from above. What do you think, as journalists, we should do? Because people are not seeing this. They're not seeing that it's the tacit approval of people from the top who allow this. They say it's passion that happens. We should follow up the stories, which we don't do. The riot is over, you leave. Forget about it till the next year and maybe do an anniversary type story. And we should constantly, I try in my columns, Demand justice. It's in the end about justice. If you punish people because it's murder that you're punishing them for, yeah, they'll stop doing it. But they know they're going to get away with it because it's done with political approval. I'd like to conclude the interview with what you've written over here. I've often puzzled over why India's fiercely independent television channels and newspapers have not been more incensed by something that has caused such severe damage to the political fabric. Dynasty, I'm talking about. Is it because journalists have become part of the game? Journalists who do not speak out against parliamentary constituencies being treated like private estates and hereditary succession, becoming the norm rather than the exception, usually get treated very well by governments. 
In an insidious form of bribery, they're offered not just access to leaders and foreign junkets when such leaders travel abroad, but nominated seats in the Rajya Sabha, subsidized housing, and all sorts in every state capital, journalists have housing colonies, huh? and all sorts of other perks that are usually available only to politicians and high-ranking government officials. The price for such media complicity has been paid by India. Political dynasties now flourish across the country, and because of this, legislatures are increasingly becoming private clubs in which the unworthy heirs of political leaders with little knowledge of governance and even less political acumen have privileged access. Like feudal potentates, they surround themselves with sycophants and courtiers. The sort of Indians who entered public life during the freedom movement out of, de out of a desire to serve India no longer exists. With a handful of rare exceptions, most Indian politicians enter politics today not for reasons of ideology or public service, but because they believe that their own interests and the interests of their family are best served this way. All of this has happened because of the example set by the dynasty in Delhi. In almost every Indian state, chief ministers use their power to send their wives or sisters to the Lok Sabha from constituencies that are not pocket boroughs but private estates. There are almost no political parties left that do not practice dynastic politics and increasingly there is evidence of a collusion to keep this diminished form of democracy alive. Would this have happened if Indira Gandhi had not led by example? I believe not. Which is why the story of Rajiv Gandhi is so important. It was with him that it all began. And how relevant it is today because it's just multiplied. Exactly. What fallout have you had after writing this book? I've been very, um, very touched that, uh, that a lot of my peers in journalism have understood the book and have said that, they are, that this is a book that needed to be written. So that's been a very good response from fellow journalists. From the court that surrounds Sonia Gandhi, I'm getting very, very bad um, messages. People saying that it's a vicious book people trying to reduce it to gossip and tittle-tattle. Those are words used by them. But in fact, if I'd wanted to do a gossipy book, there was a lot that I could have said, which Sonia Gandhi knows well that I haven't. And the only bit of the only private conversations that I've put into the book are those that reveal her to India as the public figure that she is. I haven't said anything that would personally, uh, that, you know, that was said to me personally. It's all uh, out there in the open because I really believe what, which was the American president who said about public life, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And what we've had are leaders who hide, you know, talk about journalists hiding in air-conditioned office. They hide in air-conditioned cars and air-conditioned offices and air-conditioned homes out of the heat of public life and that's wrong. But you must have anticipated the, the kind of negative reaction you've gotten from the court. You know, I, I want courtiers to respond that way because then I've really hit home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tavleen. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you.